The more glitter gifts, the better, even the background. And while we're at it, you know what? Why not turn the cursor into a spinning pot leaf? What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about MySpace. If you've watched my other videos, you know that I have a very, very special place in my heart for mid to late 2000s culture. Von Dutch trucker hats, watching the new episode of the OC, juicy velour track suits, reading the latest gossip headlines on Perez Hilton on your HP desktop PC. And there's one more very important thing to add to that list, MySpace. And MySpace truly walked so that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok could run. So how did it go from the biggest thing on the planet to pretty much a ghost town in just a few years? How did it change the music industry? Those are the questions that I'm gonna answer in this video. But first, two quick things. Number one, if you haven't checked out the Punk Rock NBA podcast, please do so. There's a link to that in the description. Number two, if you don't follow me on Instagram, I would love it if you would. There's a link to that in the description as well. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. My space bet. My space bet. First of all, in order to understand exactly how revolutionary MySpace was, we need a little bit of context. If you turn back the clock to 2003, when MySpace started, the internet was a very, very different place than it is now. Back then, you would hop on your desktop PC with probably a 15-inch monitor, hopefully on a cable modem, but very likely on DSL or even on dial-up. Then open up Internet Explorer 5 and go to yahoo.com and your favorite forums. And if you wanted to see what your friends were up to, or maybe if your high school crush was still single, well, you didn't have a lot of options. You could maybe pick up your landline phone and call them or use your cell phone, but only after nine when there's free minutes. Or you could send them an email if you had their address, that is. That's it. There were no public profiles to speak of. Like if you were just a random person, you basically didn't exist on the internet. Can you explain what internet is? That is until a site called Friendster came along, which for all intents and purposes was the world's introduction to social networking. Friendster came out in 2003. And if you look at it now, it's obviously super dated because it's 17 years old, but you can clearly recognize it as the template for all other social networks. And it was hot for a minute. It was starting to catch on outside internet dorks with like mainstream people. For example, I remember in one episode of the OC, Seth made some joke about like, do you want to be my friendster? Oh, I just love quitting. So it was working. They could have been the next MySpace or even the next Facebook, but to make a long story, they basically fucked it all up. The site was super slow and it would go down all the time to the point where it was like barely even usable. And they just couldn't keep up because remember this is before AWS scaling an application back then was way harder. And some smart people at a company called eUniverse were watching all this happen. And later in 2003, they launched MySpace. And by 2004, MySpace had become more popular and pretty much killed Friendster in less than a year by basically copying their idea, but just executing it better. The Mark Zuckerberg playbook. And with that, social media had become mainstream and the world would never be the same. Remember when MySpace was really all that was out there? <laughs> it really was. Which brings us to part two, the rise. One important fundamental difference between MySpace and Friendster is that Friendster was pretty much for anybody. It didn't really have any specific culture tied to it. But MySpace was really focused on music and entertainment. Being very focused around the entertainment allows us to be the best at entertainment news, video clips, celebrity information, music, etc. Which explains why the site took off the way it did with bands and celebrities being the early adopters that got the normies on board. And for about three or four years, MySpace was the shit. It was easily one of the coolest music communities ever created, maybe even the coolest, despite all the mini janky rough edges that it had, because MySpace was pretty much the first time that there was a truly global platform where artists could connect directly with their fans in the way that we're used to now. There was mp3.com before that, and people could put their stuff on Napster and LimeWire and the other P2P services. But this was different. For one, it was way bigger. And second, it was more than just a music player. It was truly a platform where they could put up their music, send bulletins, network with other bands, book shows. And because there were so many people on MySpace, the potential audience was way bigger. It was pretty much everything that an artist could wish for, and they jumped on it. And to this day, I think that MySpace was one of the coolest, most experimental, creative eras of alternative music. I can't possibly mention everything, but just as a few highlights, to me, the most significant thing on MySpace was the metalcore and post-hardcore scene. This is where the whole generation of bands like Asking Alexandria, Bring Me the Horizon, Of Mice and Men, 
Bless the Fall, and all that other Rise Records stuff came from. And it was so cool to see these bands go from like MySpace hype bands to get bigger and bigger. And eventually a lot of those bands ended up like being Billboard top 10 bands with mainstream radio play and stuff. And as I've talked about before, I would say the same thing about the MySpace deathcore scene. Job for a Cowboy, Suicide Silence, Chelsea Grin, All Shall Perish, and all the other zillions and zillions of MySpace deathcore bands. I have a real soft spot for this stuff because it's so shitty in like the most awesome way. You can tell it's just kids in their bedrooms trying to make the most over the top, ridiculous, like brutal shit and breaking all the rules of music along the way, like having a bass drop every measure. And of course, Crunk Core. Broken Side, to me, are the flagship band in that genre. Along with Hollywood Undead, 303, and Millionaires. And some smaller bands like Dot Dot Curve and Dropping a Pop Locket. I'm definitely going to do a whole video about Crunk Core, so I'll save the details for that. But to me, this was just peak MySpace in every way. It broke all the rules of what you're supposed to do in music. All the older people hated it. And it's only just now starting to get the credit it deserves for basically being the template for modern emo rap and trap metal. Broken side walked so bones could run. And there was also this odd little pocket of like solo pop artists that were kind of like the scene Justin Bieber, I guess. Owl City being the biggest of those, Never Shout Never, and The Ready Set were also pretty big. Smaller artists like Steven Jerzak and Nickasaur. And obviously this stuff was not for me because I was not a 13 year old girl, but it was interesting to see. It was almost like the alternative version of like mainstream boy bands. MySpace Records, um, we're a division of MySpace.com. And the common thread with all that stuff is that MySpace was the birthplace. It gave a kid in their bedroom making weird music, the ability to like reach and build a global audience. Bulletins were probably the single best music promotion tool ever created up until that time. For those who don't remember or weren't around back then, Bulletin was somewhere in between like a blog and a Facebook status update, except that as far as I'm aware, there was no algorithm to sort them. So you could basically just spam the shit out of your audience, which of course lots of bands did. And of course, don't forget to show your fans how zany and XD you are by changing your genre to something like crunk, polka, death metal. This was also the first time that musicians started to use a lot of these growth hacky kind of tools that are a lot more common now. For example, friend adders that would send mass friend requests to thousands and thousands of people. Lots of bands used these, and I think they were probably really effective because back then people just weren't really aware of this kind of stuff, especially if you're like a kid. Oh my gosh, like this band sent me a friend request. They want to be friends with me. Wow, I feel so special, except. But one of the single best music marketing and discovery tools of all time was the top eight. I found so many great bands that way, a lot of which I still listen to, for example, A Day to Remember, by finding a band that I liked and then listening to every band that was in their top eight and then listening to that band's top eight and just repeating that for hours and hours and hours. And I think it's worth noting that Spotify essentially kind of cloned this for their friends also like feature. Once again, MySpace walked so Spotify could run. And of course, no discussion of MySpace could be complete without talking about scene kids, which are synonymous with MySpace to me. And as far as I can think of, it's really the first big music subculture that was created and existed pretty much exclusively on the internet. And if you're not familiar with scene kids, then I'm referring to people who look like this or this and had profile names like X, Sarah X, Suicide X, or Becky Breakdown. Obviously they were ridiculous and I was of course way too old to be one of them. I was in college at the time, but I thought it was a super interesting subculture. And in hindsight, I think they deserve a lot more credit than they got. Because if you were around back then, you remember that everybody hated scene kids, especially like the older people in metal. But it turns out the scene kids actually did some legit stuff. Jeffree Star is the obvious one to highlight here. I remember him from writing really bad rap songs about sucking dick in like 2008. This is Jeffree fucking star. And this is a big fuck you. Tell your jealous bitches to get mad that I'm fucking your boyfriend. And don't get mad that they suck my dick. And then they make out with you after. Oh. But fast forward 12 years and now he's one of the most powerful people in the beauty space. He has his own makeup brand that's huge. I went to Ulta the other day with my wife, the beauty store, and we pulled up and I see this huge poster of Jeffree Star in the window. And I was like, wow, Jeffree, you've come so far 
from talking about sucking dick in Hollywood Undead songs to this. Well done. Andy Beersack of Black Veil Brides is another one, or as he was known back then, Andy Six. Hey, what's going on? It's Andy Six from MySpace. He got his start as a little MySpace heartthrob and turned that into a pretty impressive music career. I'm not sure if I would say that Black Veil Brides are the best band in the world, but you know, they've got two Billboard Top 10 albums, so I guess they're doing something right. And he seems like a cool guy. I do not have a Vampire Freaks. I only have a MySpace. And also, if you think about it, people like Audrey Kitching and Hannah Beth and Jack Vanek and those other scene queens pretty much created the template for what we would now call an influencer. And whether you like them or not, but they really were the first people that built up huge online followings all over the world based on really nothing more than their personality and personal style, like their hair and the way they dressed, and turn that into business opportunities. For better or worse, there would be no Jake Paul, Emma Chamberlain, Ninja, or Bad Baby, or Whoa Vicky, without Tila Tequila and Forbidden and all the scene queens creating the template for that. And by the way, I did an awesome podcast with Melissa Green and Millionaires, who was one of those scene queens. She's actually a very smart, insightful person, and it's totally worth a listen. There's a link to that in the description. And MySpace was just as big of a deal for a whole generation of kids that weren't in a band or didn't really want to be MySpace famous or anything. They just wanted to express themselves to their friends. And MySpace gave them a really cool platform to do that. Someone should really make a whole video about MySpace profile design trends because holy shit, what an aesthetic. The ability to customize your profile on MySpace was like nothing else we've ever seen. The big thing was that you could actually use your own CSS and HTML to customize your profile in all kinds of amazing, ridiculous ways. And if you don't wanna create your own, don't worry, there's plenty to choose from on Pimp My Profile, which is actually still up. Pimp My Profile. For my background. Animated glitter gifts from Blingy are to me the signature element of the MySpace aesthetic. Like some sassy slogan in a pink script font with like sparkles coming off of it. And by the way, I was amazed to see that Blingy not only still exists, but actually still has active challenges. Who are the people doing these challenges in 2020? I have a lot of questions. I have glitter on my page. I'm all that now. The more glitter gifts, the better, even the background. And while we're at it, you know what? Why not turn the cursor into a spinning pot leaf? And don't forget to add a song to your profile that auto plays as soon as anybody hits your page. I have no idea why they allowed people to do this, but of course everybody did. Bonus points if it's some super brutal extreme grindcore band just to show everybody how edgy you are. And of course the top eight drama. I was a little bit too old for me or any of my friends to care about this, but I would hear about their younger siblings getting into like blood feuds over who was in their top eight and in what order. OMG, did you see that Michaela took Tiffany completely out of her top eight and moved Jen up to number two? But in all seriousness, as ridiculous and kind of clumsy as all that stuff was, it really did change the internet forever and got hundreds of millions of people all over the world to participate in internet culture in a way that they just never had before. Which is why MySpace started to get a lot of attention in the news and then in the business world. And after a few people making offers to buy the company, eventually Fox was the one that bought it in 2005 for $580 million, which at the time seemed like an insane amount of money. Who would pay that much money for a website, especially a social networking one? And although MySpace did continue to grow after Fox bought them, I think that was the beginning of the end. Which brings us to part three, the demise. I love me some Twitter, but it's too much drama on there. And I love Facebook. But my mama on it. Technically, MySpace still exists today. Like you could probably go there right now and make a profile if you wanted to. But I think it died in September of 2006, which is when Facebook opened up to the public. That is when Facebook struck the killing blow on MySpace. It just took a couple years for it to bleed out. And why did Facebook win? Facebook started in 2004. I got on there in 2005 when I was in college, and it was just a totally different experience than MySpace. It had a really clean, minimal interface that felt more like some upscale brunch spot or cafe as compared to MySpace, which was like some fun but filthy and kind of sketchy dive bar on the wrong side of town. Good place to get laid or buy some drugs, but you wouldn't want to take your family there. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Unlike MySpace, on Facebook, there were no friend adders or bots or blingies, no auto playing grindcore songs. And although the customization on MySpace was cool and fun, it made the pages load really, really slowly, even on a good connection and created a ton of security issues. 
Facebook just felt clean and safe by comparison, which was actually a big deal if you remember all the news reports and rumors about scammers and hackers and abusers on MySpace that had parents and teachers freaked out about it, and at least to some extent for good reason. But college students were just the beginning. It was opening up Facebook to the general public that was really the game changer. Within about a year or so of doing that, Facebook started to overtake MySpace in terms of market share. You can actually see exactly when that happened on this chart. MySpace kept fighting. They did a redesign in 2010 that was a lot cleaner and more sophisticated, took care of all the security issues, but it was just too little too late. Everyone had started moving to Facebook and MySpace was bleeding out. But few, if any, make MySpace their own anymore. And it's easy to look at MySpace with the benefit of hindsight and point out all the mistakes and all the things that they fucked up, but I think that's really unfair. It was uncharted territory, so yes, they did make some mistakes, but that was because they were like building the plane as they were flying it. And the mistakes that they made helped everybody, especially Mark Zuckerberg, figure out the playbook for running a social network. Do not allow blingies and autoplay grindcore songs. So what is the legacy of MySpace? Well, the first one is that they proved that social networking was not just a fad, that it was actually a multi-billion dollar business. It also got millions and millions of people into coding and design, either by customizing their own profile or the whole like cottage industry of the people who do freelance MySpace layouts for bands or movies or any company that wanted a page. I think if you were to talk to a lot of UX people or front end developers now, a lot of them would tell you that that's how they got their start by hacking their MySpace profile. And it also changed the way we listen to music. For better or for worse, it's just different now. Because we have so many songs, so many artists to choose from, I think a lot of people, including me, now just listen to like the first 10 or 15 seconds of the first song in their profile, and if it doesn't grab me, I'm out, move on to the next thing. Or now, people writing whole songs with the specific goal of people using them in TikToks. And because of all the bands that blew up because of MySpace hype, it was also the start of the era in which bands would be judged on their social media numbers just as much, if not more than their music. Again, whether you think that is a good thing or not is a whole other conversation, but that alone completely changed the music industry and what it means to be a musician, because now you have to be good at social media, not just making music. The whole concept of an artist now is really more like a social media influencer who also happens to play music. So although MySpace may be gone, thanks in large part to Mark Zuckerberg's insatiable desire to like dominate the entire planet, in a lot of ways, the culture and habits that it established are still with us. And it really permanently changed not only the music industry, but also how we interact with people in general. And now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go check out what's new on Pimp My Profile. MySpace bet, MySpace bet. All right, my friends, that does it for this video about MySpace. I know there's a couple other videos about what killed MySpace. I deliberately did not watch those because I didn't want to like copy anything that they had done. So if anything I said or did here overlaps with what they did, that's just coincidence. But let me know what you think in the comments. Before I let you go, I wanted to mention the Punk Rock NBA podcast. There's a new episode every Monday. This is where I sit down with musicians and designers and photographers and YouTubers, creators and entrepreneurs of any kind who have managed to turn their passion into their full-time living. There's a link to that in the description. And I also want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who generously support us at the true cult level or above. I do not take any of your support for granted. I'm sincerely grateful for it every day. And it is because of your support that we're able to do a lot of things, for example, the podcast. If you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, patrons get access to every episode a week early. There's a private members only Discord server that I'm in all the time. There's a chance to have me review your band or YouTube channel or podcast or design portfolio or any other kind of project that you want to get my feedback on. So if that sounds interesting, check out the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.